Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thanks. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm delighted to present uh, today's speaker, um, uh, Professor Iman Nouwayid uh, from American News to Beirut, uh, Faculty of Health Sciences, where he's professor and dean. Um, this, yes, uh, he, he, um, uh, uh, Iman was taken to uh, San Diego to, for APHA, and I convinced him to take a little detour. <laughs> I come here to visit, along with uh, Professor uh, Rima Habib, who is also uh, a in the faculty of uh, AUB, uh, Health Sciences, who also is visiting and meeting with faculty and leaders and students uh, to discuss potential partnerships between, between our institution, our college, and their faculty, their college, um, as well with uh, uh, other partners such as MPI, and we have here, I'd like to welcome uh, Martha Newsom, who is the, the CEO of uh, Medical Teams International, who they are doing work in, currently in uh, refugees uh, settlements, in uh, Syrian refugee settlements, in, uh, both in Syria and in Turkey, in the front, uh, front, uh, border between Turkey and, um, and Syria. Um, yes, briefly, so you know, AUB, American uh, University of Beirut, uh, was founded, uh, founded, founded in, uh, in 1868. 68, 66. 66, sorry. Two years earlier than... Two years earlier. <laughs> You're computing. <laughs> That's right. Uh, we just celebrated 150, they celebrated two years ago. When I just started, it was two years ago, and they were in the year 150. Oh, it, it sounds familiar. <laughs> um, uh, also established as a land-grant university funded, founded by um, American missionaries. It's a fully accredited American university, like any other universities in this country, uh, uh, it goes through full accreditation by, um, in, in your particular case, by the college, by the Department of Education in the state of New York, I believe. Right. Um, the Faculty of Health Sciences, um, which is, includes public health, uh, was established in 1954, so it's even older than me. Um, <laughs> and their APH was established in 1970 um, and was fully accredited by CIF in 2006. And AUB's Faculty of Health Sciences became full member of AHPPH uh, last this year, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, Iman, Iman is, uh, is, a, is an old friend. Uh, we coincided in, in grad school in, uh, in Johns Hopkins for a few years, um, mm -hmm. and then there was this encounter in, <laughs> in Lebanon again. It was uh, quite unexpected, but quite uh, uh, fun. Um, he, he trained as a physician, he, he went to medical school at AUB, and then went to Hopkins, did an MPH, and a, and a DRPH, Doctor of Public Health, in the concentration in environmental and occupational health. He did a postdoc in occupational epidemiology, also at Hopkins. Joined the faculty of the AUB, AUB in uh, 1991 as assistant professor, became full professor in 2004, and dean in 2008, so he's been doing for 10 years. Yeah. My extensive <laughs> <laughs> research experience in many topics and many areas, particularly occupational health, also. But in recent years, um, also in addressing the issues of uh, refugee health, and, and which is, I think, the theme that he's going to address today. Um, and, and his talk that, uh, uh, similar to, I believe, the one he gave last a uh, couple of months ago in September, when he received the Global Health Leadership Award. From the, at the Arab Health Summit in, uh, in Washington. So, welcome, uh, Iman. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Can you hear? Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Javier. This is uh, this is um, really an honor to be here, and and thank you all for making the time to to come and listen to. Uh, so uh, my, my, I'm going to present a little bit differently than, than usual, so, uh, um, and I'll tell you why, because simply I'm recycling the, the speech. <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk about health and the Arab world, but I'm going to mostly use it to, uh, to present a conceptual framework. So uh, refugee health and other issues will be integrated within the talk. So uh, I'd like by starting again to say good afternoon to everyone and uh, thank you for being here. 
And Javier, thank you for, for, for your friendship first and for inviting me to actually uh, come over. I feared with the faculty and, and I thought that the, the best way for us to start thinking about uh, true collaboration is to get to know each other better. And, uh, and I always believe that deans... Uh, cannot take any collaboration further than uh, a, a certain distance. It's actually the faculty and the departments and the people engaged and the students who could actually develop that into true uh, collaboration. So uh, we're giving it a try, and, uh, and I think uh, uh, it's working well so far. So, and, um, and uh, uh, um, you have a beautiful campus, and I'll show you our campus in a, in a minute. So again, it's, uh, it's really an honor to, to be with you here and to speak about uh, some of the challenges uh, that we face in public health in the Arab region. And um, I, again, as I mentioned a bit, uh, a bit before, I'd like to um, state up front that I have delivered the same talk back in September at the Access 8th uh, Arab uh, Health Summit in Washington, D.C. Access is the, um, the uh, Arab uh, Community Center uh, for economic and social uh, services. So this is an organization that started in Michigan, and the idea was to actually work on uh, integrating the Arab community within the um, uh, sort of the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, environment, uh, help them legally, help them social uh, social integration, even languages, and, and, and all of that. So, And they started uh, as, as a small uh, community center in, in Michigan, specifically Dearborn, and now they're national and they have uh, branches. And they've started holding these Arab uh, health summits uh, that, that discuss the health of Arab communities, uh, Arab American communities. And then with time, they reconnected with institutions in the Arab region. And, and hence, these summits now discuss health issues in the Arab world and also amongst the uh, Arab community. So this is how I connected with, with Access. And I've, I was given this uh, sort of uh, opportunity to give a keynote speech. So this is a keynote speech that is now uh, being delivered here. And the reason for that is um, I actually wanted to, to, uh, to, uh, to give it a try uh, within an audience that, one, we have more time to exchange and discuss, and I hope an audience that can challenge uh, some of the things that are being discussed here. In a keynote address... Everyone is polite and nice, but, uh, <laughs> but in a seminar, I would hope that you engage with me and, and actually uh, contradict some of the things that, uh, that I could uh, be saying. So in my, in, in my presentation, I will not be prescriptive. In fact, I will raise more questions than give answers. To summarize my talk, I would say that the model of public health that we know and is most established globally is a model that works or could work in stable settings with well-running governments and states. The field of public health, I will argue, has not yet developed its tools to engage with public health issues in the context of uncertainty, political instability, and corrupt or failing governments and states. And so this is actually my, my practically my thesis here. It's time to challenge ourselves into a new thinking, and I would like to be proven wrong. So let me uh, start by carrying to you greetings from my university. This is the American University of Beirut. What a beautiful campus, but probably ours is one of the most beautiful campuses globally. <laughs> we have the Mediterranean there, you know. The ocean is a bit far, so it's not... <laughs> So, uh, and the campus has been declared as a botanical uh, a garden and also as a bird sanctuary. The, um, actually, the fact that this green spot in our country is so precious, because I don't think we're taking very good care of, um, of our coastal line and of our uh, uh, wild uh, areas. I'd also like to carry some... Greetings to you from, from Lebanon. Lebanon is a small country in the Middle East, as you know, whose beauty and charm in nature and cultural life may, may probably be unbeatable. I could say the same, of course, about the beauty and, of nature and people in Egypt, Sudan, Oman, Yemen, Syria, Iraq, and other countries in the region. In fact, we all share, wherever we come from, 
We all share similar appreciation to what our countries and communities provide to us or can provide to us. These are uh, photos that I've taken through my hiking trips. This is a Roman temple, by the way, one of the most complete Roman temples. Uh, So such images of calm, clarity, serenity contrast other images from the same region that highlight wars and conflicts, destruction and displacement, pollution and environmental deterioration, hatred and intolerance, anxiety and fear. These conflicting images in Lebanon and the Arab world are present as strongly all over the globe. Think of sub-Saharan African countries, think of India, and even of the United States. You would find that poverty and wealth are juxtaposed, peace and violence coexist, and hope and despair go hand in hand. So let me walk you away from the big picture and share the story of Jamal. I met Jamal through my children. He was one of the many street children in our neighborhood in Beirut. Jamal was born in Aleppo in 1990, in one of its multiple poor informal settlements. His parents were illiterate and his father worked as a street dentist who carried tools in his suitcase to pull out aching and rotten teeth from the mouth from the mouths of similarly poor people. Prior to 2000, Jamal's dad moved back and forth between Aleppo and Beirut, providing similar services. In Beirut, the dad lived in Burj al-Barajni, Palestinian refugee camp, which shared a similar state of poor infrastructure and public services like his neighborhood in Aleppo. So this is Burj Barajni camp, Palestinian camp in, uh, in Beirut. Jamal and his sibling, six siblings who did not enroll in school joined the dad occasionally on his seasonal trips and after 2000, they settled in Beirut. Jamal started working at the age of 10 or younger, shining shoes or selling items in the streets of Beirut. In 2011, war erupted in Syria, and trips to Aleppo became less frequent and then stopped completely. When war and destruction engulfed the city, and more specifically, many of the informal settlements, many of the informal settlements where Jamal's family and the poor lived. So this is actually a, the settlements, informal settlements in Aleppo. And these are the same settlements. And you look at the red dots. These are the the areas that have been bombarded and shelled during the war. And you see that there's a higher concentration of this bombardment in these informal settlements where they're mostly the poor and and, uh, displaced, internally displaced um, uh, lived. And so Jamal also feared military conscription. And their visits to Aleppo practically stopped. Jamal became a refugee, one of the more than one million Syrians who moved to Lebanon. So again, looking at the the map of Lebanon, you see there the change between 2012, 13, 14, and 15, and the uh, blue dots there actually represent where you had refugee settlements, or where the Syrians have settled, not necessarily in settlements. They could be in their neighborhoods and in towns and others. And you see the concentration of, uh, of refugees, Syrian refugees in Lebanon. Keep in mind that the number of Syrian refugees went up to close to 1.5 million refugees in a country where we have 4.5 million Lebanese. So again, just to, to help you to do the math, talking about 400 million Americans and 100 uh, million uh, Mexicans move into the country within, within three to four years. I'm 
I'd like to ask your president what would his reaction be. <laughs> We've actually hosted the 1.5 million uh, refugees. He, his already difficult life, however, turned to the worse when his brother, a father of four children, aged four months to eight years, died. He did not die at war, but ironically, he was electrocuted when he was fixing the TV cable on a, rain, on a rainy day. Now, Jamal and his sister, the only two of their family left in, Be in Lebanon, bore the responsibility of, for the welfare of their orphaned nieces and nephews. They succeeded in registering the children as refugees with the UNHCR, which is the United Nations uh, uh, High Commission for Refugees. And when Jamal secured an orphanage for the children and ensured they will continue to receive UN support, he decided it was time for him to leave Lebanon. Unlike many Syrians, he did not immigrate to Europe, but rather chose Algeria as a destination to join his parents who had relocated there one to two years before. He entered Algeria illegally, worked on his official papers and started working as a waiter. He was happy and settled and got married in less than seven months. His story unfortunately ended badly. Negotiating on behalf of his niece, who suffered repeated beatings from her husband, who happened to, be, to also be her cousin, he fell victim to a dispute, and he was stabbed to death by his cousin. Jamal is now back in Aleppo, resting in peace. I share with you the short and sad story of Jamal's life to make a few points. Jamal embodied in his life these contrasting images I projected before. Serenity and violence, content and ambition, love and fear, hope and despair. All I presented at the macro level, in fact, touches the life of every one of us. Some of us, however, like Jamal, carry the hard part of the, bar of the bargain. Jamal fell victim to multiple types of violence. In fact, he lived a life course of violence. The official records and statistics will report Jamal's death as a homicide. Will it mention that he was a victim of domestic violence? I doubt. But what truly killed Jamal? Is it economic, is it economic violence and deprivation? Is it missing on education? Is it the poor environmental settings he lived in? Is it the political violence? Is it the military violence and war that destroyed part of his city and neighborhood? Is it the xenophobia and discrimination that he might have experienced in Beirut? Or is it the lack of statehood? I was today talking to, uh, to some of the global health uh, students, graduate students, and I would say all of this overlap with many of the topics that they are researching. Who is Jamal? Is he a Syrian or a Kurdish Syrian? Is he a street ch child, a proxy father, a displaced person, a refugee, or a migrant worker? How do we categorize Jamal? Perhaps as an illegal immigrant, an illiterate, a young man, a Muslim, an Aleppo? Who is he after all? I guess many of us in this room may ask, may ask the same question and realize that we are all the outcome of multiple identities and multiple experiences. Being American is one attribute that connects many of you here, but will exclude me and others. Being a public health professional will lump me with some of you, maybe most of you, but will exclude others. You add gender, profession, place of work, place of residence, etc., etc., and we will find that we are very similar and yet very different. How important is identity and how does it define us? How do we use identity to enrich us or protect us from harm or probably cause us harm? 
putting Jamal's story into a theoretical framework, our collective and personal health and well-being is determined by three spheres of influence, the social, the political, and our identity. I start with the social and economic sphere. The social determinants of health are as well defined by Marmot and others. They are the circumstances in which people are born, grow up, live, work, and age. Public health with its critical assessment role has done, one in has done well in highlighting the social, economic, and environmental determinants of health. Research has shown that health varies with socioeconomic status. The wealthier do better than the poorer. The educated live longer and are healthier than the less educated. Maternal and child mortality decreases with education and wealth. Migrant workers are less advantaged than nationals. And health status varies with race and color, to give few examples. So looking here at this one, just, just an example of life expectancy and disability-free life expectancy at birth. And you see that it decreases with increase in income deprivation. Another one, you asked experience. And again, you see that performance, in this case on life expectancy, differs by gender and by race. And if we take a global level, at a global level, these inequalities repeat. Life expectancy in Africa is lower than the rest of the world. Mortality and morbidity from communicable and other preventable diseases are more abundant in poorer countries. Malnutrition claims the lives of people in these countries, and smoking has become a leading killer in the global south. But within country, one of the strongest indicators of a country's ill health is the gap in income between the lowest earner and the highest earner. Countries with more inequity in income have poorer health indicators, even for the rich. So even if we look within the richer communities, those are that have a higher income do better than those with a lower income. As for the Arab world, it has witnessed significant improvement in social and environmental conditions over the last century that had a positive effect on health. More than 80% of the people in the Arab region have access to water and proper sanitation. Immunization coverage is almost complete. Polio has been eradicated. And literacy and schooling have followed an upward trend. Access to health care, better education, and improved infrastructures has contributed to better health status. So if we look at the MTGs here, the Millennium Development Goals, and we see that between 1990 and 2010-11, we see the reduction in the under five uh, child mortality from 90 to 58 per 1,000. Look at maternal mortality, 358 down to 261. The births attended by skilled health professionals goes up from 54 to 69. Safe drinking, more or less the same, sanitation coverage also increased. Again, keep in mind that there are differences between, um, between countries. These overall indicators, however, paint a rosier picture than the reality. The Arab region is not consistent. Most of these health indicators lag behind, lag behind in Yemen, Sudan, Eritrea, and sub-regions of other countries. They also lag behind among particular population groups within each country. Our region is very heterogeneous in distribution of wealth, in history and culture, in burden of disease, in political systems, and in environmental changes, to name some. So uh, this tower, do you know the name of this tower? In the... This is a... Um, 950 meters, so it's 3,000 feet. This is 35,000 feet high, Khalifa Tower in, uh, in Dubai, okay? Next to it are people who are starving in, in the region. You look at the burden of disease and compare the low-income countries, the middle-income countries, and the high-income countries, and you find a typical thing. So with the low-income countries, you find that people are still 
dying from infectious diseases. The high-income countries, we start talking about road safety and, and, and mental health. In the middle-income countries, it's NCDs with uh, some of the um, other uh, uh, non-communicable diseases. Our region now faces multiple challenges. It hosts more than 30 million refugees and displaced people within and outside its countries. It is a young from within and outside its countries. It is a young region with around 60% of the population below the age of 30. So the population in the Arab region is expected to double within 40 years. Okay, so our 350 could become 600 million, and mostly it's the, the, the young population. So again, this is something that our school has been engaged quite a bit in the youth and adults in trying to make the argument that the youth bulge is not only a warning for disasters. Actually, we could look at it in a positive way and say this is a source for hope, and these are assets and resources for our future. And so we need even to change our framework when, when, we, uh, when we look at, uh, at the youth. And our region suffers from water insecurity, food insecurity, and the rising impact of climate change. So uh, let me show you here, this is, this is a very interesting thing that is surprising even to me every time I project this slide. So, uh, so if you look at, these are all uh, uh, countries in the Arab world. And the 500 year is considered the water poverty, the absolute water poverty level. 500 cubic meter per person of, of course, natural water resources. And you look here and you see that most of the Arab countries are actually be below the poverty, uh, poverty level. And, uh, and as we move into 2030, 2050, you see even a further decline. So this is where the average of the Arab world is. This is where Asia, Africa, and the world are. So major, major actually uh, uh, scarcity in, in water. We're a biocapacity debtor, and you look at the, at the region, it's, it's all in red. For some reason, uh, Javier Spain is with us here. <laughs> so, but we're, uh, our footprint is much more than the, our uh, capacity and what our environment can actually uh, provide to us. So now even for countries where health indicators were improving, conflict and war have reversed these achievements drastically, which takes me to the sphere of politics. So when we move to the second sphere of influence, the political, although Rudolf Virchow, the, the father of social medicine, stated in 19th century Europe that politics is nothing but medicine at a grand or large scale, Political epidemiology, which examines the relationship between politics and health, is a relatively new field. Defining politics as the structures, processes, and outputs that affect population health, and analyzing the European experience, it was reported that higher levels of democracy are associated with higher life expectancy and or lower mortality. However, the process of democratization was associated with higher mortality from several causes of death and even a temporary decline in life expectancy. This is the experience of East Europe and, and Russia, and this is the experience we're going through in the, in the, uh, in the region. So the, the move and the call for liberation and democracy comes with a price. And for health comes with a lot of deterioration and loss of achievements over, uh, over the years. Putting aside the neoliberal understanding of democracy, I would say that the latter message rings home, although our setting is very different. In our region, authoritarian political systems, occupations, conflict and war, and the remaining vestiges of our history of colonialism have dominated the political scene for a long time. And so, And in spite of reasonable achievements at the health front, people revolted and demanded change and freedom of, extra, of expression at a high price. The loss of achievement, the loss of achievement 
is most strikingly observed in Iraq and Syria, and now in Yemen. In the 1980s, Iraq ranked among the top countries in the region and global south in terms of health indicators and social and economic achievements. Similarly, in Syria, in spite of significant inequalities within the country, free or almost free healthcare and education was accessible to all and the high proportion of medicines was manufactured within the country. All or almost all of these achievements collapsed. Syria, now in its eighth year of uh, a civil internationalized war, has more than seven million internally displaced persons, has lost more than two-thirds of its doctors who fled the country, and has observed the total or partial destruction of most of its healthcare facilities. Health, as you see here, and this is actually uh, some work infographic uh, that followed a, a paper that was published by colleagues from our faculty on the weaponization of, uh, of health care, using, using health as a weapon in, uh, uh, of, of war. So health was used as a weapon of war. Now, this presents a serious challenge to public health and other health professionals. Besides engaging in provision of health care and humanitarian support, we are practically para paralyzed in the face of raging wars and violence. So I repeat, as public health professionals, in spite of all of our ability to engage, we are practically paralyzed in the face of raging wars and violence. Yet, public health professionals continue to insist that health must be separate from politics, that it is apolitical. Can it really be so when the reality is that politics and political circumstances and power imbalances are major determinants of health. After all, it is politics and policies that define distribution of wealth and services, including health services, and it is politics and policies that prioritize development choices. So look here, the fact that expenditures on the military exceed expenditures on health in our region, and this was documented back in 2011, even before the current events, is a political decision. So look at this. Again, the green bar here is actually the division of the blue bar, which is the expenditure on health, divided by the red one, which is expenditure on military. And you see that the green is above the, the dotted point here for all the regions except our region, where we spend more on military than we spend on health. And this is in 2011, before the Arab uprising, before all, all the violence, civil wars, revolutions and counter-revolutions that are taking place. And before some of our countries committed to hundreds of billions of buying, uh, uh, buying arms. It is the politics and policy that marginalize the poor and send them to wars. It is our political choices and policies that explain why 1% of the world's population own more than 50% of the world's wealth. It is what explains inequities in our countries and globally. As indicated above, examples in the Arab world are abundant, as they are elsewhere. How can the one million cases of cholera in Yemen be seen as anything other than a political determinant of health? And how can the cutting of funding to UNRWA with its huge repercussions on the well-being of Palestinians be seen as anything other than a political determinant of health? Public health is political, and we must concede this if we stand a chance of trying to enhance health. I now add a new complexity to this already complex picture, a third sphere of influence besides the social and political, which is identity. This too is embodied in the life of Jamal. Kelly and Millward, 2004, defined identity <laughs> as how one regards and judges others and how one regards and judges self. It is how we regard our skin color, physical look, gender, accent, 
or dress attire, our self-identity, and how others judge these same aspects, visible or perhaps non-visible and abstract attributes. So as you see here, there's our personal identity, how I see myself and how, I, and how others see me for the same attributes that I carry. I have to say this is a sensitive and challenging concept. And some would lump it under political determinants of health. I elected to single out the concept of identity, not because I'm an expert on this, but simply because I believe it sits at the center of our humanity and the human values. It defines our sense of justice and equality, and it is used as a tool to make policies and wage regional and global wars too. It's the other, and how do we perceive the other? Here we have a choice of either celebrating diversity and valuing our multiple identities as individuals and societies, or transforming this into a source of divisiveness and exclusion at the local and global level. Are you an Arab? One is asked. A Muslim? A Christian? A Jew? A Black? A Hispanic? A Hindu? A Kurd? A Sunni? Or a Shiite? This is the latest in our region. It is this attempt to put persons into single identity boxes that transforms richness of diversity into conflicts. Religions and religious practices which embrace tolerance, cohesion, content, and love have been expressed in hatred, intolerance, violence, and rejection. This was used as an excuse to label whole countries as, and regions as innately violent and extremist, and we are victims of that, and justify a global war on terror. As health professionals, we should celebrate value and uplift our differences and our multiple identities, and we should not shy away from examining such identities and their impact on health. And by the way, I recommend that you listen to this TED talk so just uh, Google danger of single uh, uh, story, and it's, it's, an, it's a remarkable uh, TED talk. So looking at the three spheres of influence concurrently will make the case for their independence and joint influence on health in each country and at a global level. Within each of the three spheres is the elements of a choice between what should be done and what can be prevented and stopped. Over the last eight years, war, intolerance, and terrorism are what labeled the Arab world in the minds of many. The images of brutal wars and actions wipe out all the good that is concurrently happening. For example, the horrible fact that more than six million Syrians have fled their country to the neighboring ones should not undermine the fact that four million Lebanese have hosted more than one million Syrians in their tiny country. The despicable fact of foreign interventions in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Libya, and other countries should never dilute the power of giving and humanitarian aid to the victims of these wars and atrocities. People who are killing and instigating wars and people who are aiding refugees and the displaced share the same nationalities, the same religions, the same gender, the same history, and the same language. It is not our identities, it is our politics and values that unite or separate us. Only when we realize this, we can make a difference. We should continue as public health and other health professionals to focus on improving the social determinants of health, not continue to dismiss addressing the political determinants, including the issues of identity. We owe it to Jamal and the millions of youth globally who are falling through the cracks as victims of unjust political and economic systems and as victims of social exclusion based on identity. Circling back to the beginning of my talk, what can we do? Basically, we should collaborate at the domestic, regional, and global levels on building human resources of health, exchanging expertise and resources, supporting institutions, building health systems, conducting joint research, and implementing and monitoring intervention programs. 
as citizens of the world, we should sing the song of diversity and tolerance and advocate for peace and justice. And we should be willing to discuss and dialogue with others who have different views from us about the same events. Short of that, our successes and achievements are constantly under threat. At our Faculty of Health Sciences, we do not shy, from such, uh, shy away from such a role. Institutionally, what we have done institutionally, we have built three independent yet in, in, in interactive centers on research, practice, and policy that delve into with our disciplinary uh, departments into sensitive and complex public health issues. So we're doing a lot of research on many, many topics. Currently, we, are leading, we, uh, we have also published a book on public health in the Arab world as a platform for voices from the region. We also led the Lancet special issue to analyze health in the Arab world from a political perspective. Currently, we are leading the Lancet AUB commission in, on Syria, which is deeply current and political. Notwithstanding the tensions and serious disagreements within, between the commissioners in analyzing the Syria crisis, the commissioners are successfully documenting the impact of this raging war on health systems and people's health using the social and political lenses, including identity. I started with the story of Jamal, and I would like to close with the story of Mahdi. Both are men. I admit, but only because their stories were part of my life experiments this year. Mehdi is a 47-year-old man. His father of two children was born in Rashaya and never left this beautiful uh, uh, village. This is actually a photo taken from his, the balcony of his house. So he has never left his beautiful village in the Beka facing Mount Hermon. He was our guide on a 15-mile hike through the mountains between Rashaya and Hasbaya. He knew the mountains very well since he herded goats for 20 years. When I relate to him the, the public perception that goats herd the environment, as you see here, they're eating oaks and, and plants, <laughs> he simply pointed to a plant to make a point. He said honeybees love to collect honey and sugar drops from the flowers of what might seem to be an insignificant plant to many. He said, it is the best honey bees can find, but these flowers survive for a few weeks and the plant dies, dries up gradually, becoming delicious food for the goats. Our ecosystem, he said, is rich and diverse and can accommodate all of us. It's not honey bees against goats. It is simply about how can honey bees and goats live together and allow other living things to live, to survive and rejuvenate. It's not nature, he said. It is us and the choices we make. So I end by saying to Jamal, the illiterate Syrian Kurdish street child, and to Mehdi, the environmental friendly, friendly nature lover, goat advocate, Lebanese middle-aged man, I bow in respect to the many lessons we can learn from those who are marginalized, stereotyped, and mostly not listened to. Thank you. So I still have like 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> yes. uh, thank you. My name is Susanna. Uh, we met. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a lot of questions. But I'll start with one. Um, so, based on the conceptual framework that you had, you had the identity, social, and political. Um, so, when I was listening, I kept wondering, though, where does human rights fit into this? And if you're considering having a separate human rights component. Um, added into the theoretical framework, or if it's going to be intertwined into mm -hmm. one of those three? Interesting. Interesting. I got a similar question in Washington, D.C., actually. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, to tell you the truth, I haven't thought much about this. So it's just to be upfront with it. 
But in, in, in my mind, the, the, the human rights part is, uh, is part of our health and well-being. So, uh, so again, if you think about, about the human rights issues and uh, what's acceptable, not acceptable, is, is determined by, by, by all of this. It's, so, uh, so it's about identity. And so how do we look at the other who is different in whatever orientation, in color, in gender, and, and nationality? Um, how do our politicians and political decisions actually uh, deal with that? And again, sort of the uh, social determinants. And of course, when we talk about environmental injustice, we're talking about human rights right there in there, that, uh, that we do know that uh, uh, the, environment, the burden of environmental deterioration and pollution is not spread equally. And it's actually the poor and the un and disadvantaged that pay a higher price for that. So uh, somewhere in there, it is, it is integrated in the, in the middle of, of the model, but I promise to start giving it a, a more thought. Yes. Uh, Yeah, it's uh, tell you that uh, taking this path or, or declaring declaring that there is a political dimension to whatever we're doing. Um, yes, is yet that you you start actually treading a, a very sensitive and risky path. So, uh, and this is why I linked it to the whole thing of the institutional build up. As individuals, it becomes a personal a personal mission. And you, you find very many of, uh, uh, not many, many, but few of our colleagues in the field of public health that you feel that they are sort of carrying this sort of uh, torch of, uh, of human rights, torch of the changing the politics, uh, anti-nuclear uh, arms, anti-militarization, and to this and anti that. And you find that it's in most of the cases it's either individuals or small group of individuals. What we've done at the faculty we have said that as an institution, as a faculty, we should not shy away from engaging with these questions. And we should protect as much as we can faculty members who decide on asking these critical questions. Is it difficult? Of course it is difficult. So uh, you publish anything that is critical of the Ministry of Public Health in Lebanon, and guess what? Our students are out of uh, internships in the, in the, in the, in the ministry. And, and so we have, to, we have to be extremely careful about, about how to say things. You, uh, in some countries, you pay a high price. In Egypt nowadays, uh, you, you try to uh, experiment with uh, not even political. You talk about any of these social complications and, and unions and, and any of that, and, and you're, um, you're thrown out, either thrown into a prison or thrown out of the country. So, uh, yeah, in, in many, many countries... Um, that's a very difficult thing to do. And I'm not calling upon any of you to become a political... I don't refer to myself as a political activist, frankly. But, uh, but I, all what I'm saying is that we need to, within our public health uh, at, uh, educational programs and within our research, to, to, to keep the full pictures, not to move into doing, this, doing public health work in a naive way, assuming that our good deeds in a place will lead to good results. We need to understand that there are others who are undermining the, the stability of, of, of places. Um, so yes, you have to be extremely careful that's, uh, uh, at, at the individual level and even at the institution level. And this is why many, many public health professionals have elected and preferred not to get into the politics of it. But Obamacare is politics. Okay, all what you're talking about and the media and elections, it's politics. It's impacting your rights, human rights, and impacting whether immigrants come in or do not come in, who's kicked out, who's treated, who's not treated. These are political decisions. And when you go and vote, that's a political uh, decision one way or the other. So it's, uh, sorry, Dr. Chi. I fully agree with you when you said uh, public health is, is politics. And I also tell my students that if you're afraid of politics, you're in the wrong, wrong profession. You should not study public health. You might study biology. <laughs> and I like your, uh, your framework, particularly the political uh, determinant of health. Uh, I have opportunity uh, to be friend and talk with one of the commissioners 
of the Federal Commission for Social Determinants of Health, mm -hmm. and who is also the leader in uh, People's Health Movement, uh, okay. Professor Fan Bang. I ask her that you being a, a progressive public health professional that as a leader in People's Health Movement, and also being one of the 19 commissioners who authored that, the WHO uh, Social Determinants of Health report, you probably are aware of the controversy of that report. And she said yes, and she knew very well uh, the criticism of the social determinant report, uh, social determinant health report, mainly uh, is intentional, let up that political determinant, and which the the people's health movement call it the determinant of all determinants. Mm -hmm. And she agreed, and she knew. She explained to me why it was intentionally left out, because the of the nineteen commissioner. It's a mix of progressive and conservative professional. So the report is the result of compromise. And it's not just a social determinant of, of health report that's compromised. Before that, the MDG was intentionally left out that political dimension. And now the SDG also left out that. So I have a question for you that given the mainstream, including WHO, including Gates Foundation, all the big players intentionally left out that political I mentioned political determinant of health. What we as a progressive public health professional can do to bring it up, maybe as you mentioned, as a sort of resistance. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the reason we're bringing it out because they're leaving it out. So it's, uh, um, I, I, th I think one, we have to be vocal. We have to be vocal and, uh, and uh, uh, many, many public health professionals are, are very reluctant to talk about the issues of, uh, of politics because of, the, again, the, the mainstream. We, were you at the APHA? Uh, so, yeah, yeah. So APHA, American Public Health Association, is, in my point of view, a conservative public health association. Okay? So uh, although they're progressive on many things, but they are less so on other things. And when it comes to the politics, it divides the association, maybe not equally, but there's, it's, it's a source of, of division. So and this is why I keep repeating, and this is something I always share with my faculty and students, that we, we shouldn't be too idealistic and rosy about saying the public health professionals, we're not all the same, frankly. There is a spectrum. There's a spectrum of public health professionals, and I'm not passing any, any value or saying one is better than the other. I'm saying there's a spectrum. Some people are doing a great job, and we should continue to do that. They're very focused um, a sort of exposure to risk uh, uh, relationship. And we should continue to do that because we need to advance knowledge and in specific things. But uh, the voices that talk about the surroundings and, and the, the politics should be, should be encouraged too. Um, it's not that we didn't have a choice, but I think we're living in a region where it strikes you in the face. So, so, uh, so all the, what the health professionals have done over decades in Iraq has gone like this. All the, our colleagues in Syria who have done wonderful work, there are a lot of criticism on for the systems there, but it's all gone. So it's, and then it's sort of saying, what, what's happening there? So you, you spend 10, 20, 30 years building a system, and then there is war because you have an authoritarian system or because you have inequalities or the wrong political choices, and boom, we destroy, destroy our hospitals, we destroy our clinics, we destroy our heritage, and, 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 and all of that. One of the things that the Commission might touch in the Commission on Syria is the fact, um, things that we don't talk much about in public health, but the fact that when you, we destroy part of our history, the heritage, the old, the old markets, this is something that happened in Beirut, our old souks that go back 1,000 years were burnt to ashes during the Civil War. That's part of our history that has been plucked away. Now, all the new generation haven't seen the, the, the souks, haven't seen the old markets. doesn't mean anything to them. But those who have lived it, we do know what we've lost. And, uh, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's these kind of things that impact well-being and health. I don't think I have an answer except that we need to keep working with each other to, to, to advance this kind of thinking. Yes? I'm just curious. It strikes me that your, your um, solution in terms of collaboration, where would you place that in the model? Because it, it seems like the why piece, why would we, be, why would we want health? 
and well-being at a personal and collective level is maybe a piece that's missing, or is the intangible part of the model that's not spelled mm -hmm. out? Yeah. Maybe that's 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 my entry point. Uh, maybe that's my entry point. And again, it it depends on uh, on how do we find how do we define health. Uh, so uh, so I wouldn't define health as as physical physical health. So if if health is all about how we uh, enjoy our lives, what what uh, the, our surroundings mean to us, what the others mean to us. So it's this social interaction, it's the freedom of speech, is uh, freedom to wonder, freedom to think differently, freedom to act differently. Uh, if this is what health and well-being means, um, then, then um, I think that's, that's inclusive. So I'm not using health in a way that is uh, uh, limited to, 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 to public health professionals or even those to, who carry a degree in health. And uh, I think people who care about trees and forests are, are, are perhaps providing an opportunity for better health and well-being than many, many other, other people. So it's, it's not. Mahdi. The Mahdi model. Yes, please. One more question. Yeah. So go ahead. Like, even with the best intentions of the people in the communities that you speak of, you have overwhelming forces, for example, environmental or warming and water deprivation. You have po population, which is expanding. Remarkable. Yeah. You have all the proxy wars of the large powers around the world that are promoting or supporting a lot of the war. Andrew Bacevich teaches a lot about endless war. It seems like these are almost impossible things to overcome, even with the best intentions, improvement of education to some degree. But I, I don't know how, I guess you just work in your own local environment as best you can. Yeah. But unless yeah. we had address some of the larger elements that impact this, it's, uh, this yeah. is all just sort of... I think, I think you put your, your finger on the, on, the, on, the, on the issue, on the wound. Uh, and, and, and that's quite challenging. That's quite challenging even to survive from day to day. It's... it's uh, so we published, an, uh, I was co-author on an article that was published uh, by The Lancet on this uh, health in the Arab world. And, and actually it is uh, some of these uh, slides on, uh, on military and uh, food insecurity come from that, uh, from that paper. I'd recommend it to, to all of you. And, and we've actually said ecological sustainability in the Arab world, colon, a matter of survival. We've actually said exactly what you've said. That if you look at what's really happening, if the population is almost doubling in 30, in 30 to 40 years, and water is, uh, availability is going down, and the climate change is, is, is getting, getting worse, and political decisions are going in the wrong direction, and we're having wars and displacement and refugees, put all of these things together. How can you get out of this mess? So, uh, um, and I think, I think the, the, the only way of, uh, of to deal with this is to insist on the fact that those people who think differently, and that's why I think this is a global thing. Because if we look at the region, and we, I don't want to limit it to the region, you look at Africa and some people might draw a very also uh, uh, um, negative image about, again, a picture about what could be happening in Africa or in some, in some areas. The feeling that, that humanity is self-destructive to one, ex one way or the other. But, but the, the only way out is the kind of conversations we're having now. Because this is not about us in the region dealing with our problems. This is about all of us looking at what's happening in our region as a global issue. And this is one of the messages I tried to share with the global health uh, uh, graduate students this morning, is that, that, that the, global, the global context of what we're doing uh, is, is important. That uh, what's happening in Palestine, what's happening in Lebanon, what's happening in Yemen, what's happening in Iraq, is not an Iraqi problem, is not a Syrian problem, is not a Yemeni problem. It's actually an international uh, problem. It's a global problem. And the only way to try to perhaps change the tide there is for like-minded people across nationalities and borders who work together and can think uh, together. 
But yes, it is not a, a rosy picture. But this is one of the things I face as dean when I talk to my uh, new students. Um, it's like, how can you present the reality of what we're facing with, with data and at the same time uh, telling them, this is why you're in the right place, and this is why you should do public health, and this is why we should change things around us. It works, so I can fool them for a few years. And then they move on. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I'm, I'm, there's this element of optimism that I think should never leave us, should never leave us, and this is what should drive us all. <coughs> okay. Thank you very much.